This is Just Asking Questions, a show for inquiring minds on reason. Can a Catholic be a socialist? Can a libertarian be a Catholic? Just Asking Questions. I'm Zach Weissmuller, Reason Senior Producer, joined by my co-host Liz Wolf, Reason Associate Editor. Hey, Liz. Hey, Zach. Today's guest is Trent Horn, an apologist and speaker for Catholic Answers and a defender of capitalism. He hosts the Council of Trent podcast and has authored several books on Catholicism, including Can a Catholic Be a Socialist? The answer is no. Here's why. We're going to talk about that, discuss some of the anti-capitalist rhetoric that seemingly come from the Vatican over the past decade, analyze the rise of post-liberal Catholics on the right, and also hopefully figure out why I surrounded myself by so many, with so many libertarian Catholics lately, including my esteemed co-host and our producer, John Osterhout. Trent, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. So the subtitle of the book I just mentioned gives away the answer, no, a Catholic cannot be a socialist. But before I get to that, let me turn that question around a little bit. How can a Catholic defend capitalism? Well, I think a Catholic can defend capitalism when they move away from caricatures of what capitalism is. Uh, the idea that capitalism is synonymous with just an unrestrained free market, dog eat dog. If your idea of capitalism is just Gordon Gecko, greed is good, or uh, Ayn Rand's The Virtue of Selfishness, then yes, it would be it would be very difficult to defend capitalism in a Catholic in a Catholic framework. If if you idolize private property as being, you know, some kind of an idol or the highest good of all things. But Catholicism teaches that God is the highest good of all things, and God created the world for human beings, what's called the universal destination of goods, but he still allows human beings to own parts of it for their own good and to be able to apply for the good of others. So when you go, for example, in uh, John Paul II, in his encyclical uh, Centissimus Anus, He's asked, well, can you, def you know, can a Catholic be a capitalist? And he says, well, it depends what you mean by the word capitalism. If he says, if by capitalism, it's an economic system which recognizes the fundamental positive role of business, free human creativity in the economic sector, then yes. But he calls it more a market economy or a free economy. He says, if by capitalism you mean freedom in the economic sector, not circumscribed within a strong juridical framework, uh, which places its service to human freedom in its totality, uh, then he answers in the negative. So I think you have to define what you're talking about here. And, and to be honest, there really is no such thing as this idea of pure laissez-faire capitalism. I mean, you need courts, for example, to enforce the business contracts that make capitalism function at all. So sometimes I think that this boogeyman of unrestrained laissez-faire capitalism, it only exists in the mind of critics. <laughs> And so the there's a perception that the sort of current leadership in the Vatican has is anti-capitalist. I know from reading your book that uh, Pope Francis is not a Marxist, um, but you can understand why people wonder what his attitude towards capitalism is. Um, I, I pulled a clip from his 2017 TED Talk, I believe it was. Yeah. Uh, and he talks a right. little bit about capitalism in that talk. Um, I've done the same thing here that we did in a recent interview with a uh, recent speech by Javier Malay, because they're both speaking Spanish. I've right. actually translated the Pope's uh, words into English using AI. So we're, oh, wow. gonna play, we're going to play that and it's uh, synced to his lips. So I want to listen to Pope Francis talk a little bit about capitalism and then get your further reflections on what you think he's getting sure. at here. Those dirty capitalist AI tools make it easier to understand the Pope. Only education in fraternity and concrete solidarity can overcome the increasingly prevalent throwaway culture, which concerns not only a wide array of food and goods, but first and foremost, most importantly, 
the people who are marginalized by these complex and often impersonal techno-economic systems, where often without us realizing it, man is no longer at the center, but the products of man, often more valued than human considerations. What's your reaction to what Francis is, Pope Francis is getting at there? Well, I think what Pope Francis is saying echoes earlier pontiffs' criticisms of socialism. Uh, when you look at Pope Leo XIII at the end of the 19th century, just you know, a few decades after uh, Marx and Engels are putting forward things like the Communist Manifesto, and you have the worker uprisings in Paris, and you have socialism growing and people calling for labor revolts, Pope Leo XIII was speaking about how the error of socialism is that the human person doesn't rest at the center of it. Rather, it's these lofty goals of equality, of human beings exist to serve the state, to maximize productivity. That way, uh, what is produced can be equally distributed amongst everyone. Uh, so th their criticisms of early socialism was that the human person is not at the center of it. Rather, it's these particular ideals or essentially planned productivity. And what Pope Francis is saying would also apply to market economies and capitalism. Uh, it, was, it was William F. Buckley who put it really well. He said, the problem with capitalism is capitalists, but the problem with socialism is socialism. There's nothing that you can fix from the system, but because human beings uh, have a sinful nature, we are capable of, of good, but our natural self-interest can be distorted so that we serve our own interests at the expense of others, uh, exploiting other people. And think about it in any workplace, right? There's always that kind of attention. Like the boss would love if people came into the office and worked for free. And the employee would love to go into the office and get paid for not doing anything. So there's always going to be a tension between the two. And in modern economics and market economies, there seeks to be a balance between those, those types of opposing interests. Now, I think what the Pope is getting at here is that in some countries, especially in more developing countries, those who control capital or own businesses can be in more of a position to exploit workers, to conspire, and this is something even Adam Smith recognized in The Wealth of Nations, understanding, you know, people treat Smith as if, oh, he's just this unfettered apologist for capitalism. Uh, but even he recognized that merchants could conspire together to, to make prices high or to keep wages low. And I think what the Pope is getting at here is that in some capitalist or market systems, uh, consumers can be carried away by their consumerism and not take into account workers who are being exploited and being kept in conditions that are that are dangerous. I mean, we look, for example, in, I want to say, where was it, in, in, in Burma, or it was uh, th that one uh, s factory collapse that happened uh, in Southeast Asia just a few years ago. It was a horrible workers' disaster. And I think that many of those in the history of labor are what spurs on common sense regulations and people recognize that, oh, well, it's they want uh, the market to be able to work for everyone. As soon as it works for me, you say, oh, I want it to to work for everyone as well. So when the Pope is speaking uh, in his encyclical Laudato Si, he says that business is a noble vocation directed to producing wealth and improving the world. The question, the problem is, of course, that we're all sinners. And so we need things to help to restrain where self-interest can bleed into selfishness. Well, so in 2013, in Evangelii Gaudium, Pope Francis wrote, to sustain a lifestyle which excludes others or to sustain enthusiasm for that selfish ideal, a globalization of indifference has developed. The thirst for power and possessions knows no limits. In this system which tends to devour everything which stands in the way of increased profits, whatever is fragile, like the environment, is defenseless before the interests of a deified market which become the only rule. And then he talks a lot about, you know, how inordinate consumption, as he terms it, and this unbridled consumerism combined with inequality um, is what is, in his words, damaging to the social fabric. I mean, this looks like a very uh, intense uh, slapdown of a lot of the components of the capitalist system that we live under. What do you also make of this? Specifically, uh, specifically, and this also trickle down economics. So, um, yeah. yeah, right. Right. And I think here what is important to remember, and this goes back to Quadragesimo Anno and Pope Pius the the Eleventh, uh, who was saying that economics and moral science each apply to their own spheres. So it's always difficult when the Pope speaks 
on uh, contemporary issues and areas that we would call interventions in the prudential order. So there's going to be areas where the the Catholic Church's authority resides in faith and morals, teaching the doctrines that God has revealed, uh, morals, how are we to live. But we live in a world that is constantly changing. And so when you have the rise of, of new technologies, whether it's bioethical technologies like in vitro fertilization or just new technologies, even 200, even 200 years ago with the rise of the Industrial Revolution and industrial capitalism. It's so very different from what the church had taught for 1800 years. I mean, throughout nearly all of human history, 99% of people lived in poverty or extreme poverty or at least very low poverty. And the few wealthy people were just those who could basically steal or inherit wealth from other people. That's why in the time of Jesus, there was a proverb that said, uh, every thief is sorry, every rich man is a thief or the son of a thief. But you then you had in the, the the 17th, the 18th century, the 19th century, through the division of labor, specification of labor, through the growth of private industrial firms, productive capacity increases, driving down the costs of goods and services, allowing them to be allowing things that were once only could only be had for for the the wealth. Sorry, the the rich. You had someone like uh, Hosea Wedgwood, for example, during this period. He, he was born with like a disability, one of 13 children born into poverty. But he created a pottery service that revolutionized how to take pottery wares that were once only for royalty and making them accessible to the common man. So he invented things like the money back guarantee or catalog sales. Right. And so now you have people can, you know, they can access more goods than they normally wouldn't. So I think when when the Pope speaks on these issues, we have to we have to avoid two extremes. One extreme is to say, oh, the Pope doesn't know what he's talking about. He's not an economist. Why should I care what he has to say? And the other extreme would be everything he says, every advice that he gives on a matter in the prudential order has to be followed. Yeah. And in a document from the church called Donum Veritatis, it says that not that the magisterium, the teaching authorities of the Catholic Church, like the Pope and the bishops, not every suggestion for how the prudential order there should be an intervention is necessarily correct. So it should be it should be given a respectful hearing, but it's not a te authoritative teaching like on faith and morals. So he's now, essentially okay. so he's essentially cool. telling us that um, attempting to. Uh, not give in to our worst consumerist instincts, but rather to seek a sort of asceticism is how we probably ought to live. But he's not necessarily saying that there ought to be any state intervention that forces that. Is that what you're right. saying? Right. Yeah. In many of these documents, these encyclicals, you have to make a distinction between a moral command that's binding on the faithful right. and what might be called an aspirational statement. Okay. Uh, saying that this is something that would that would be an ideal that is proposed rather than impose. And, and I will be honest, I do have a fair amount of disagreements with how Pope Francis speaks about economic problems, uh, because I find that many of the criticisms are very vague, that he might identify a legitimate problem, but the solution or the criticism involved is quite vague, and I'm not sure what he's exactly proposing to remedy the problem. Though I do recognize a, a kernel of a, a legitimate criticism that, that we have to look at. I mean, for example, we have a problem in capitalist societies of companies doing things like planned obsolescence, right? That I remember, I mean, I still have toys that I've given my kids that I that my parents bought for me like in the 1980s that still work. But a lot of, you know, or appliances in my parents' house that still run to, the, to this day. But it seems like everything we buy today, it seems like there's a bit of a conspiracy among corporations to make sure it's going to break in like five years so that you have to buy, so you have to buy something else. And I think that's something all of us could agree is a kind of consumerism like it'd be really nice to be able to move away from something like that to better serve the interests of everyone involved so i think he does make a legitimate point here but sometimes i believe the criticisms can be overly broad or overly pessimistic from him when it comes to market economies and i have a bit of a honest idea i mean it is more of a psychoanalysis here I, i'm not saying it's it's the exact solution but this is a pope who was bishop in buenos aires during the argentinian economic collapse and we find many people are extremely uh, have a extreme antipathy towards market economies 
when they go through a, a market collapse. Wait, wait. Uh, so we saw the same thing in the 1930s in the United States, which was called the heyday of American communism. The American Communist Party had its largest growth in members during the Great Depression. No. Uh, you know, the same thing, we saw that growth of young people wanting socialism when? Well, after the Great Recession in 2008 and 2009. I think a lot of that does color Pope Francis's thinking towards market economies when he's when he's speaking about them. There used to be, you know, famously in the mid 20th century and late 20th century, the Catholic Church was like institutionally anti-communist. Yes. Um, and now things are a little more in flux. Obviously, the Cold War is over. So, you know, communist, anti-communist is not even really the right way to think about things anymore. But there is a definite strain of Catholic thought, the kind you see represented by writers like Liz Brunig, the left Catholics, who yeah. do say that, you know, socialism really is, does follow from Christianity and I guess Catholicism specifically. And, you know, the case they're making is fairly straightforward that it's difficult. The Bible says it's difficult for the rich to get into heaven and that you right. should share your wealth and so forth. Um, what is your you know, theological case against socialism in a nutshell? Right. And here we always have to define socialism, similar to the criticisms of capitalism, because there's going to be a difference between what Pope Leo XIII and Pope Pius XI uh, condemned uh, and Pope Pius XI was very clear. It, he said that no good Catholic can be a true socialist. And even in his time in the 1930s, he recognized that there was a violent form of socialism that was associated with the Soviet Union and with communist governments. But even more moderate forms of socialism, he condemned those. He praised them for their desire to not use violence to achieve their ends. But he still condemned them nonetheless because they violated things like the right to private property, a right that Pope Leo XIII said is sanctioned by natural law. So when you go back to Pope Leo XIII condemning socialism, and a lot of these more left-wing Catholics, the left Caths, uh, what they'll often say, Jose Mena, for example, is another example. Back in 2016, he wrote the, the Tratanista Manifesto. Uh, so, I mean, it's a weird crossover you, that you've got Catholics who love going to the traditional Latin mass and, want, and would want to march with the Sandinistas and, you know, be this far left on, on economic policies. It's really like the clash of, of two worlds, basically. Uh, so w when you see, going back to Pope Leo XIII and his criticisms, he's looking at this saying, oh, what they'll say is, oh, well, they're just condemning atheistic socialism, atheistic communism. They're condemning the fact it's a godless system. But that's not the case. Pope Pius XI was very clear that there are people who claim to be religious socialists and you cannot be. Pope Leo XIII's argument wasn't about atheism so much as it was about the rejection of private property, that when a man works, he essentially tra trades in his labor for his wages. <laughs> and if he's not able to dispose of his wages as he pleases, as Pope Leo XIII put it, then he's not really free. His right to private property has been rejected. So if the state is able to control that or prevent him from using his wages and saving them to invest in private property, Pope Leo's solution for the worker was to live a life of thrift and to take his wages and to buy land. That would be a typical 19th century solution to poverty. Buy land, make it productive, and it's yours. It's yours to use. So there were people at the time who said, like Rousseau, who said, well, you have the right to use the land, but you don't have the right to own the land. And Pope Leo said, no, that's not true. When the laborer, he converts his labor into wages, he owns the wages. When he converts his labor into tilling the land, he owns the land. He turned it into something that's productive that wasn't productive before. Very so Lockean argument. Yes, there are. Yeah. Uh, yes, there's a lot of elements of Locke that you can see in Pope Leo the Thirteenth, and also Adam Smith, which is interesting. That he says if socialism were adopted, this is Rerum Novarum Fifteen. He says the door would be thrown open to envy, to mutual invective, and to discord. The sources of wealth themselves would run dry, for no one would have any interest in exerting his talents or his industry. So if it's a, just this hard kind of socialism, I think when it's pressed and you bring the Catholic tradition into it, left Caths will say, oh, well, that's not what I'm talking about. And I think, honestly, have you ever heard of the probably the Mott and Bailey fallacy? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, we let me explain it for our listeners. We're very used to this. Oh. <laughs> yeah, well, but it's a, the listener. 
<laughs> yes, it's for the listeners, this comes up all the time in a wide variety of subjects, and it comes up all the time with socialism. I believe it was Nicholas uh, Shackford who coined it back in 2005. So the idea is this, you have a medieval village and you've got two things, the Bailey, a wide open area and a desirable area you want to be in, but it's very difficult to defend from marauding soldiers or barbarians, right? And then you have the Mott. The Mott is this tower that is protected. You're safe, but it's dank, it's dark, it's gloomy. You don't want to live there long term. You only live there to stay safe from the marauding hordes. And so the idea is that when people come to attack, if you're in the Bailey, you run away to the Mott, stay there to be safe, and you go back to the Bailey. What Shackford noticed is that when people are debating ideas, many times they'll have an idea, let's say socialism, and they'll split it into two types of things and do a sort of bait and switch with people. And so with socialism, what they what they want, the Bailey, is uh, you know the, the abolishment of private property, uh, that the means of production are socially owned by the community, which turns out to be the government, essentially, because none of us are going to show up at the community meetings and vote on everything every week. We're just going to elect somebody else to set wages and do all of that. Uh, you know, to to abolish the ability to to become wealthy, billionaires don't exist. Social production, social control of the means of production. Uh, that's what they want. That's the Bailey. But the problem is that's very, very difficult to defend, especially in the 19th century. Pope Leo the Thirteenth had many principled arguments against this. Then you have Pope Pius XI in the 1930s, Pope John the Twenty Third in the 1950s and 60s. Uh, having practical arguments saying, look what happens when this is put into practice in the Soviet Union, in China, in North Korea, in Cuba. Uh, and you say, oh, you know what? That's not what they'll say. Well, that's not the socialism I'm talking about. What right. I'm talking about is just that uh, workers have their basic workplace protections. There's there's a, a minimum wage. You can't just pay someone a penny an hour. And there's there's fire escapes at the doors. It's not like the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory disaster in 1921. You know, and people won't die of poverty. That that there'll be social welfare programs to protect people. That's what I mean by socialism. And even capitalists and free market people would say, yes, yeah, they would say I, I agree with that. Uh, and they'll say, great, then we agree on socialism. And when you retreat from your criticism, they leave the mott and go into the bailey and say, ah, see, we all agree. We should all be socialists. And they go back to the meaning that they really want. It's like they feel comfortable selling this version of socialism that's like gentle socialism, right? As opposed to what we all know socialism to actually be, which is incredibly um, coercive and deeply violating, right? It violates our ability to um, take pride in the dignity of work. It violates our ability to right. own private property and to decide how we provide for our families and what we do with our money, our earnings. Um, it, it violates our ability to sort of be individuals uh, apart from the system and to have right. different values and preferences and make different choices. But when they peddle gentle socialism, which they frequently you know, tout Scandinavia as the example of this, which we've discussed on a previous episode of Just Asking Questions with Johan Norberg, Right. How actually, a lot of the wealth generated in Scandinavia and the things that people frequently turn to are really the the blessings uh, of capitalism and of a system that frankly allowed free markets uh, to flourish and an awful lot right. of business growth for many, many decades, as well as a lot of natural resources. Well, in Sweden, and Sweden has more right off yeah. of that. They've been able to coast on their former glory for a long time. What were you right. going to say? They're ca it's a capitalist society. Uh, that invests in itself. But Sweden has more billionaires per capita than the yeah. United States. I mean, that, I mean, that Ikea money has got to go somewhere. <laughs> and in Norway, I think one of the things that's really interesting, I've written about this for reason before, um, you know, they've basically hiked the wealth tax on some of their multimillionaires and billionaires, and they've seen massive capital flight, a ton of migration to Switzerland. And it's like, well, wait a second. You literally have quotes from these Norwegian billionaires who really like the system in many ways that they've right. uh, come up under. And yet they say, hey, look, at a certain point, we feel so persecuted by the state and like the, the businesses that we built that have enriched our economy here are really just being seen as cash cows by the state and being used in ways that we don't like, and therefore we will move and they will no longer have access to that. And it's like, I'm sorry, what could be a tougher indictment of the system than these actual people who are affected by this saying, look, the fact that the government is hiking taxes on me affects my decision making and my behavior. I think there's really, it's like people see this gentleness of the Scandinavian countries, but they don't actually 
look at it in with any sort of like bird's eye view. And it's like their concept of it's like a tourist concept of what Scandinavia is. It's like, oh, things are clean and pleasant. But there's right. not much of a deeper understanding of like, for example, union power and how the way that unions work in a lot of other countries, like in Latin America and also in the United States, which is different than Latin America, is different than how unions um, function in Scandinavia, which tends to honestly, they're a little bit less muscular there than the U.S. equivalent and certainly far less muscular than the Argentine equivalent, for example. There's all right. of these fallacies baked into the way people are selling socialism. And it's it's stunning to me that this Mott and Bailey, I think it's because people don't know about the Mott and Bailey. And so they're willing to buy it. But you just described it perfectly. Right. And the, the problem here is when you water down enough, to say, I'm just proposing a gentle socialism to say, no, you're not. All you're proposing is the most basic things. Even a free market capitalist would agree that government has the right to use tax revenue to provide entitlement programs to those who cannot support themselves. I have a great quote here, actually, from uh, the Catholic philosopher Edward Fazer. Uh, he wrote an article in the Cambridge Companion to Hayek. Uh, so obviously people will think that like Hayek, you know, the, the the knowledge problem of economics thinking, oh, he's just this unfettered capitalist. And the quote, but the idea here is it's saying that socialism is identical to reasonable workplace regulations or entitlement programs for the poor. That just is not socialism. And so Fazer says explicitly that Hayek explicitly allows for regulations to ensure safe working conditions and for a safety net for those unable to provide adequate food, shelter, and health care for themselves. The Hayek who thought that the smallest tax increase is but the first step toward the gulag exists only in the imaginations of uncharitable critics and simple-minded admirers. So I, th I think so. there, this, that's the, yeah. Go this ahead. is a common thread between Adam Smith, between Milton Friedman, and between Friedrich Hayek, where I think people consider them to be so radical on this issue of like poverty alleviation, when in reality, there's not really much in any of their each individual's writings that indicates that like Hayek yeah. was not especially radical on this. I think many people, um, even some of the classically liberal economists who we most admire, you know, carved out a little bit of space in their minds for, hey, maybe there's some valid role of the state to attempt to provide for the poor. And that's not to say that it'll always be done efficiently or well, but it is to say that that seems like, uh, in many right. cases, a reasonable use of state power if we are going to have a state at all. And yeah, I, have I mean, two thoughts on that. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, Zach. Oh, no, I was, I was <laughs> the two just things. Yes. Go ahead, Trent. Yeah. Go ahead, Trent. Yeah, the, the two, two things on that. One, and here, the Catholic Church recognizes that even here, that, that the state has a, a duty to care for its citizens, though Catholicism teaches what's called the principle of subsidiarity, mm -hmm. that a higher organization should not do what a lower organization should do. So families ought to care for themselves unless you know they are simply unable to do that. And that's why Pope John Paul II in Sanctissimus Annus, he speaks about how a welfare state, it isn't intrinsically evil, but he does say that it can be grossly inefficient. He says that a loss of human energies and an inordinate increase of public agencies, which are dominated more by bureaucratic ways of thinking than by concern for serving their clients, and which are accompanied by an enormous increase in spending. So even he recognizes that. But I think the overarching goal, and then I definitely want to hear some more of your, your thoughts on all of this, is that there is no such thing as Catholic economics per se. So there's no such thing as Catholic economics, like there's no such thing as Catholic medicine. Like it's not like Catholics discovered, actually we have our own way to do heart transplants and all the other non-Catholics do heart transplants a different way. No, it's just one kind of medicine. Much the same, economics is a science. It's the science of studying the allocation of scarce resources to satisfy unlimited demand or however you want to define it. There are just economic, the law of supply and demand isn't owned by any religion. It's just the law of human nature. But there is Catholic medicine in the sense of, hey, there's some so-called medical procedures that Catholics recognize are not morally licit, like uh, abortion, for example, because it directly takes the life of an innocent human being. Or Catholics recognize some economic arrangements, like uh, some wages can be unjust, even if two people freely agree to them, because they're extenuating circumstances that uh, result in a person agreeing to a, la a wage that is incapable of providing him the basic dignities of life or something like that. So I think that's always important to recognize when it comes to Catholic economics. There's no the science of economics is the science of economics. But Catholicism, like with other sciences, provides moral principles 
basic ones, and then people might disagree on the finer points of application. But there might, so there's there are no there are no Catholic economics per se. Um, I wonder if there are Catholic politics, um, or if there. I, I guess the reason, it, like par- partly why I want to have this conversation, is just the sure. mere fact that I have noticed that me- a lot of libertarians seem to be Catholic. A lot of libertarians around me, a lot of, uh, li- you know, I already mentioned Liz here. We're just surrounding her. you, Zach. This is all a, it's a conspiracy to proselytize, okay, which Catholics don't really tend to do that much of, but John yeah. and I have joined forces. The, there's there's okay. others on staff. There's some prominent libertarians like Tom Woods, who's a, a yes. very devout Catholic. Um, is there, have you noticed some sort of overlap between libertarians and Catholics? And um, what do you think explains that? Well, I think what can explain it, and we do also have to keep in mind, I think there's probably a greater number or percentage of, of non-Catholic libertarians. And so there often heads can butt in, in that regard. But yeah. I am noticing more, more vocal individuals uh, who are proposing uh, economic commentary and solutions to economic problems who are Catholics often tend to, you know, look at libertarianism or be very sympathetic to other libertarian thinkers while trying to tweak some of the things that they're saying. I think deep down it comes to, I think many libertarians, even if they're not Catholic, even if they're not Christian, they do have a correct understanding of human nature. I think that mm-hmm. socialists uh, often fail because it assumes that human nature is better than it really is, that people will naturally be altruistic, they'll naturally work hard or extra hard to be extra productive, but to only receive back what society thinks that they should have, and that they're just naturally going to work for the common good of society. Um, and this goes back, I think, to, to Rousseau, who said, who basically took the Christian ideas and inverted them, which is the idea, the Christian idea is we're born in original sin, we're born with a tendency to sin, and it's society, the family primarily, but also society at large. It's that job to mold us into people who go against our selfish tendencies, our desire to sin, to serve God, ourselves, and our neighbors, to grow in virtue. Uh, So born born bad, or not so good, not totally bad, Born bad, society makes us uh, society makes us good. Family primarily, the first society. But Rousseau and others would say, no, 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 no. There, there was a first innocence, uh, the myth of the noble savage, uh, that that human beings are born good, and really it's society that deforms them. It's society that that makes them materialistic and evil. And to fix people, you have to fix society. There's that's the two groups. One group mm-hmm. says to fix society, you have to fix people. Another group says to fix people, you have to fix society. Now, there can be unjust social structures, right? If you, if a society enslaves a group of people based on their race and you belong to that race, it's very difficult to flourish as a human being until you change that law, you know, to, to allow you to flourish that's preventing you from doing so because it's, it's an evil law. But really, the, the problem is ultimately in the human heart. And so I think libertarians, uh, for a variety of ways, maybe it's religious or maybe it's just pessimism from just looking at the world as it is. <laughs> My co-author, Catherine Bacalik, and I call that Christian realism. We have Christian sure. ideals, but we see the world as it is. That sure. you see, uh, you know what? People aren't always reliable. People uh, care more about themselves than others. People, they, they drop the ball, they sin, they're scandalous. And so libertarians, even if they're not religious, they have a natural desire to want to diffuse power because of a lack of trust in, in other human beings. And I think that that kind of overlaps a bit with Christianity understanding our, our sinful uh, proclivities in that regard. So I, I think there can be a little bit of, I, I don't know if that overlap um, makes sense of it. This no, is that does very make a lot central. Of sense. This is very central to, I think, how I look at things and how I'm able to reconcile my Catholicism and my libertarianism. I think, to me, it's always very intuitively made sense that I believe man is fallen. And I don't think that that is um, a hopeless thing. I think there's like accepting that as the starting point of man is fallen. um, And from the sort of more libertarian perspective, that man acts in his own rational self interest. And then from the libertarian perspective, working to create systems that build that in and have that as the underpinning as opposed to altruism or benevolence as the underpinning, just assuming that people will behave in their own rational self-interest. And then, you know, in the realm of Catholicism, seeing, okay, man has fallen. 
And so the means of salvation and the means of overcoming that is through, you know, the moral right. influence of the family and society and the church around you and through turning toward God uh, right. and toward prayer to um, and toward confession to attempt to, over the course of a lifetime, better yourself and bring yourself closer to God. Right. Um, but again, it's not a gospel. I think c Catholicism seems very dark and cynical to people, but the idea that we are made in the image of God, the idea that we have right. uh, you know, access to confession, that we can repent and atone, the fact that we can better ourselves um, and you know, make ourselves more uh, aligned with God and what he wants for us. To me, this is like a very fundamentally hopeful message in the same way that with libertarianism, okay, just because we're behaving in our own self-interest and that sometimes... Um, you know, it means ba bad people are doing bad things. We can build a system that allows people to use that self-interest to guide them to be productive. And then we can engage in all of these voluntary transactions and build good things from that. Like to me, it starts, both things start from a really dark place, but they go to really hopeful places. And I think that that's something that for whatever reason, a lot of my socialist friends or my non-Catholic friends don't quite get, where I think they have a, a fundamentally opposite starting place. That, right. That means does that yeah, make sense? So, to you said? Oh, absolutely. It, yeah, and I mean, it's, you know, specific. It's what's interesting to me is speci it's specifically Catholic. Like, um, yeah, you know, not you're even right to, like, like, you're yeah. right to point out, Trent, that of course there are libertarians of all sorts of different faiths, or uh, very commonly, no faith, because objectivism is a big strain of libertarian thought, which is explicitly atheistic. Um, right. But for I, I don't know. I I haven't done any surveys on this or anything. It's just you like just my notice impression. It. <laughs> my impression, yeah, is that the kind of outspoken religious libertarians t seem to be Catholic. Like, is there something specifically about Catholicism versus other variants of Christianity that you think, for some reason, a, a lot aligns with this political philosophy? Yeah, I'd have to think about it more. I, I guess I do no. wonder why we don't see uh more evangelicals because there was an older thesis that uh calvinists for example were the heralds of uh capitalism and that was max weber's uh thesis right why why do we see uh protestant countries more industrious for example and one theory was that oh well in protestant in some forms of protestantism especially calvinism you don't know if you're among the elect right god decides who's the elect he he mm -hmm. saves people and you can't lose your salvation so it's like, oh, well, how do I know I belong to the elect? Oh, we got to show it through your action. Well, how do you show that? Well, typically, if you were Catholic, you would show it through acts of piety. You say your rosary, you go to daily mass. Uh, but the Protestant Reformation you know, did away with that. So how do I show that if, you know, you're Calvinist, we don't have a lot of acts of piety in church? Oh, well, I'll be uh, industrious and show that to other people and I'll just work, I'll work really hard. Though I've heard other competing theories that one reason the industrious, industrialism took off more in Protestant countries than versus Catholic ones in Europe was just they're colder. And in the winter, you'd rather just be in a factory or a kiln. And whereas in Southern Europe, which is a lot more Catholic countries, uh, it's natural during the summer, you know, you have a, a siesta in the afternoon and deal with the, the heat. And in the winter months, that's the time to enjoy yourself if you don't have to harvest anything. So there's different theories about that. But when it comes to, ca to Catholicism and Christianity, I do think it's interesting that when people think of capitalism, oh, it's just about selfishness. No, it doesn't have to be about that. In fact, if it is about that, uh, you end up not being able to have fruitful transact. You know, what yeah. makes a capitalist system work great is when it benefits both people. If your business only benefits one party, yourself, it's not going to stay in business long unless there is an external agency like the government that props it up and keeps it in business and continually funds and subsidizes it. So, I mean, you look at what Jesus said, right? What's the greatest commandment? Uh, love your neighbor as yourself. So what's interesting here is Jesus is saying, look, as a baseline, you will naturally love yourself. You will naturally provide for your self-interest. So the greatest command is to love your neighbor, to develop virtue and to make an act of will, to do something that doesn't come natural, but to do that to your neighbor, what you naturally do to yourself when it comes to providing for your self-interest. And Liz, I, I, I agree that it's interesting when you're talking about you know self-interest in a system where we serve one another while serving our own interests. That is the genius of, of free markets. It's the famous quote from Smith. It is mm -hmm. not from the yeah. benevolence and of the butcher, yep. the brewer, or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from their regard our to their own interest. Interest. Yep. Yeah. 
Um, I have two theories on this point uh, sure. as to why there are a lot of libertarian Catholics out there that we are obviously just going entirely off of anecdata here. We don't actually have it's data. Vibes, that proves okay? this. this is a vibes cast now. It's a vibes cast. Um, <laughs> But I think one is libertarians and Catholics, I think both place a really high premium on consistency. We mm. care about making sure there's no holes. And sometimes that takes us to really crazy places. But the consistency, it's like this extreme mm. obsession, this fixation on internal consistency of the framework. And I find that to be really satisfying about Catholicism and really satisfying about libertarianism. To many people, mm. that's off-putting. But that's how my brain works. <laughs> and then I think the other thing is... Catholics and libertarians, I think, both value and think a lot about humility. And I mean, we were even talking about Hayek and the knowledge problem earlier. And there's a right. little bit of this sense within libertarianism of like some of the folly of the state exercising so much power over us is that they will simply not know everything. They won't have perfect knowledge. And it is, in fact, very hard to understand what's going on in all of the different sectors of the economy and then to ensure that people uh, with aligned incentives are acting to manage each of those. And so libertarians right. recognize the fundamental foolishness of that mm. endeavor. Yeah. Um, and I think humility is actually very central to libertarianism. Uh, and I think that's dissatisfying to some people, right? Because some of right. the appeal of lefty socialism is a sense that we actually can fix all of the problems that ail us. And actually, we simply need to appoint the right people to positions of power. And actually, pretty much all of these things can be managed and optimized. And yet, that's not really how it plays out in practice. And so I think libertarians look at those historical examples and say, wait a second, we actually can't really do this. And I think by the same token, humility is a significant part of Catholicism. And even the act of um, having faith and growing in your faith requires a certain amount of like, I think for many people, a little bit of a jump of like, I I am not going to be able to prove everything in a way that perfectly satisfies um, Christopher Hitchens' objections, but there's right. still something deeper that is pulling at me that I know to be true on this very right. fundamental deep level. And I think with Catholicism, at least for me, the more I've tried to strengthen my humility, the deeper I found yeah. my faith to be. If that I have one sense. last, yeah, I have one last theory popped in my head. Mm -hmm. I think that the Catholic commitment to natural law, I yeah. think also might explain why you see more Catholics who are outspoken among libertarians, even versus Protestants or many Protestants. Their ethics often come from a biblical perspective, but that's difficult when scripture was written at a time 2000 years ago when economies are just completely different. You can't apply it one for one today, but you have a rich intellectual tradition within Catholicism of natural law and of following principles, first principles in metaphysics, and reaching them to their natural conclusions in different situations. This would also explain why there are so many Catholics in uh, the Supreme Court or in the judiciary. I mean, you've read, right. you can read articles, uh, you know, going back to uh, different Supreme Court nominations, and some people saying, "Are there too many Catholics on the Supreme Court? You know, why are there so many Catholics in the in the federal judiciary?" Uh, Honestly, it's for the same reason why there's so many Jews in law, why there's so many Jewish lawyers. Judaism and Catholicism both have a rich legal tradition, right? Jews follow mm -hmm. uh, the rabbinic laws, and these are these are very uh, uh, analytic, uh, well-faceted systems that have been developed for Jews to memorize and have that kind of analytic, legal, if that branching tree thinking. And Catholics use something similar. So I think so for many Catholics, when they approach and look at economics, mm -hmm. we talk about natural law, like in ethics or human anthropology. It applies very well to economics that if you do this uh, as a government intervention, a business intervention, this is liable to happen. And I think the Catholic mind can graft onto that in a special way. So I think that, I don't know, that might be another thing to look Could at. Could you explain what natural law is? I, I'm sure yeah. this is a complex topic, but I don't know if you can boil it down a little bit for us. Sure. So a law is a is basically a directive or a command that is issued by a competent authority. And so Catholics actually recognize four different kinds of laws. So we recognize the eternal law, the eternal law is just what God says, I made the world. Here's how I want the world to be. I'm all knowing, all powerful, all good. So I made the universe. I want it to be this way. That's his eternal law. Uh, the natural law is described as the rational creature's participation in the eternal law. So if you were able, capable of reasoning, you can say, oh, there's ways I'm supposed to act. 
there uh, that I am not just merely an animal driven by instinct. I was created with a purpose to act in a certain way. So, for example, the most fundamental part of the natural law would probably be do good and avoid evil. Okay, you can't just stop there, though, because you get what is good, what is evil. You got to branch out and figure out what all of that is. So natural law, when we recognize that there are are moral commands embedded within nature that we can that we can recognize. So Paul talks about this in Romans one and Romans one and Romans two that there is a law written on the human heart that you have a rational mind, even if you're not religious, even if you're you know born on, you're on North Sentinel Island, you know with not contact with the outside world, you can recognize this this universal moral law. You're supposed to participate in it and act in a certain way, and that is why many socialists would go against that. Say, uh, no. There is no such thing like that. We just decide what is most pragmatic and what will work best for society. There is no law above us that we have to adhere to or to follow. And that's why Marx and classical socialists and communists have been so opposed to religion because they want to be the ultimate foundation of the moral life and take God out of that equation of the natural law. So that's why, you know, similar with Nazi Germany and the Nuremberg trials to say, look, there is a law even above nations by which nations can be judged. So that's the mm -hmm. natural law. And that, you know, we see that in virtue and vice and how we relate to one another. And from the natural law, then we get things like positive law. So we get human laws. You know, we pass laws to govern society. We have laws in the church, civil laws. But even if you read Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter from a Birmingham jail, uh, and people are saying, you know, why, why are you doing this? You know, the, the law says you can't eat at uh, this lunch counter. Why can't you respect the business owner's right to say that? That's the law. And what King, what, I would, what uh, Martin Luther King Jr. said in the letter to Birmingham jail was, and he quotes St. Thomas Aquinas in the letter. He says, uh, an unjust law is one that does not correspond to the natural law, the law of God. And so he said that these human laws that are unjust, well, they're not really laws at all. They don't, com they don't command uh, authority or obedience from us. I like that theory for the genesis of the Catholic libertarian. Um, it explains a lot to me. Um, it, it makes uh, me understand where Liz is coming from a, a bit more, perhaps. Um, and also, um, I, you, you know, you mentioned uh, sort of like the Jewish representation and law. It's interesting. Like, there's a lot of a lot of the libertarian luminaries are also Jewish uh, thinkers. You know, uh, Mises and Friedman and Rothbard. Right. Um, I wonder if there's, you know, a similar explanation at, at play here. But um, yeah, you really I, managed to take the there are a lot of Jewish lawyers concept and bring that home and make that like actually very uh, salient and relevant. Frequently, people go to very dark places. From oh, that yeah. Well, no, I mean, if I mean, you look very, on the Internet. So, yeah. Yes, I am. Half my family's Jewish. Uh, well, the, our sir, my my surname is actually Hornstein, and my grandfather oh. changed the changed his name after the war because he got beat up for being a Jew. So yeah. uh, you know, I would have if I had kept it. I would I would have had a great law practice, Horn, Hornstein and Hornstein or something like that. Why aren't but you a messianic Jew? I'm confused. Well, because what I believe is that Jesus established. Uh, you know, he he established one church, one universal church, and so. Uh, while you can be ethnically Jewish, what I just recognize is that in Jesus, who is Jewish, Paul, who is Jewish, they established just God's covenant that was once just for the Jews has been expanded into the new covenant, has been expanded for for all people. But I, I brought that up to say, yeah, when you look on the internet, there are people who say yeah. not so nice things about me when they, yeah, they no. know that fact. But I like to turn that around to say, you know, why are there Jews in so many of these places? Not necessarily something sinister. It's that, well, that's just a rich tradition. And this, yeah. this idea of, of valuing the intellectual life or valuing the fact of wanting to understand like not just even natural law but just how does the natural world function so like the word science like scientist that was that word was coined just a few centuries ago in the middle ages people often think of like aquinas and medieval catholic theologians only talking about you know how many angels can dance on the head of a pin that's not true they they actually practice what we call science today they called that natural philosophy. And well, Albert the Great and others would catalog the what we call scientific discoveries. They catalog that as natural philosophical discoveries. And so you have people like the Augustinian monk Gregor Mendel, who is the father of genetics and the law, the Mendelian laws of inheritance. Monsignor Georges Lemaitre, a Catholic cleric who, who, in, who discovered what was later called the Big Bang Theory. And so I think that within Catholicism and this reverence for God created the world with an intricate set of laws, metaphysical, ethical, scientific, 
a desire that, and also many Protestant traditions say that we're so sinful, the human mind is darkened, it's reasoning, like we can't even know God without, you know, by faith alone, basically. Well, no, Catholics don't have as dim a view of human nature. We don't have as bright a view as the socialists do. But no, we can use our minds to discover the world God created. We can use our minds to know the evidence in the universe that God does exist. And so no. when all that's put together, it would also explain why, why are there so many Jews who win Nobel Prizes, right? The value of in the intellectual life and the desire to understand the laws of nature, the natural law. So I think all that kind of comes together. Yeah. But so now, now that I have a better understanding of the mind of the Catholic libertarian, sure. maybe I can get a, I'd like to ask you about if, if a lot of this grows out of natural law, what is your understanding of liberty? Uh, since that's central to libertarian politics, um, you, I suspect you might view yeah. the concept of liberty differently than some libertarians might. How do you view that concept? What, what's your conception of liberty? Yeah, I would say that liberty is the freedom to choose the good, but it doesn't follow from that that the state should create a set of laws so that people can only choose the good. Uh, in doing that, the state might create greater evil. So for example, go back to God creating human beings, right? I mean, God could have made us so that we only ended up choosing good things. Either he creates a world where we happen to do that or he directly controls our wills so we only choose the good. But God chose not to do that. He chose to allow evil and suffering to exist in the world because he's all powerful, all knowing and all good. He can bring even greater goods from this. Right. If you had a world without suffering, for example, there are goods that would not exist. You couldn't have compassion, for example, in a world without suffering because compassion is just suffering alongside somebody. So similarly, when it comes to liberty, I reject the view that liberty is just the ability to do whatever you want without infringing on the rights of others or doing what you want without violating the non-aggression principle or, or something like that. Uh, true liberty would be uh, the ability to choose the good. We don't want to confuse liberty with license or something like that. But on the other hand, even though that's what liberty is, a state may have prudent reasons for allowing people the ability uh, to legally choose to do some things that are, that are not good. In fact, you go back in Catholic history, uh, St. Augustine and St. Thomas Aquinas argued for allowing prostitution to be legal because mm. they felt like the world would convulse with lust if you didn't have this outlet for human depravity. Now, today, I would say I, I just now there's a prudential intervention. I actually what's funny is I disagree with and there's going to be some libertarians who agree with Aquinas, non-Catholic libertarians who agree with Aquinas and Augustine. Whereas I would disagree with that today that I workers are going to pull out their Aquinas and start like loving Thomas Aquinas all of a sudden. That's the great if they, if, if, the, podcast, if they could read Aquinas, that's a price I'm willing to pay. If <laughs> to our get... podcast can get one libertarian prostitute to read Thomas Aquinas, then this is a job well done. Yeah, go so ahead. I'm clear on that. So I'm clear on where what you're saying. You would not be for legalizing sex work. I wouldn't be for legalizing. In fact, I did a, a debate on the Whatever podcast uh, a few mm -hmm. months ago. Uh, myself and Lila Rose debated this with Destiny okay. and a Let's only and, and an OnlyFans uh, prostitute, uh, and we went back and forth. And my argument is that there are going to be uh, we have more empirical data now that shows that l legalizing prostitution. Uh, results in an overall net harm to society. Like there was a study done in 2013 of 150 different countries showing that when you legalize prostitution, there are two different effects. One is called the substitution. So re the relation of legalizing prostitution to illegal human sex trafficking. And there's two effects to that. One would be the substitution effect. The idea is there should be less illegal trafficking because now men would rather pick legal prostitution because it's safer for them. That's the substitution uh -huh. effect. But the other effect is called the scale effect. When you make something legal, people are more likely to try and say, oh, it's legal now. I guess I'll give it a shot, you know, because it's, you know, the law would often prevent people from, from doing it. And because more and more men then want to pursue it, there aren't enough women willing to do it. And the scale increases too much. And women have to be brought in through trafficking to meet the, 
the hot, much higher demand. And what that study in 2013 showed is that the scale effect dominates the substitution effect and creates an overall net harm. It's a, it's a debate subject for another time, but I would say that Catholics can uh, endorse the idea of, of, of liberty being that which is choosing the good. You know, I'm not saying that the state should just, I don't want to go back to saying the state, you know, restricts every single movie that's over more than rated PG or something like that, the Hayes Code or something like that. But at the same time, the state can also restrict and legally suppress certain things, even consensual activities between people that are deleterious for the common good of society. So when, oh, so when I'm sort of going around the libertarian world, I begin to notice these sort of two different types uh, of libertarians, but I'll, I'll caricature them for the sake of argument. And there's sort of a range between them, right? One type of libertarian is the view that I espouse that appeals to me, which is similar to what you described, Trent, which is that it's important for the state to stand back and allow us to um, exercise our free will and to make our own choices um, and to live out our values. But I'm not values neutral as to like what those should be. I think that pursuing the good life is very important. I think some people do that better than others. And at least for me, that looks like... um, you know, my my primary duty is trying to be an honest and ethical journalist while also raising my son and being a good wife to my husband, right? Like, and working to serve my community. And that takes some more hedonistic forms. Like, I like throwing dinner parties and like there's wine involved, right? And like a little bit of marijuana, right? But yeah. there's a little bit of like, I had this idea of like the good life is community oriented um, and the good life is pretty family centric. And you know, I tried to make sure that I'm not scrolling away on my screens and constantly ordering crap online to fill my house up with stuff because that's just not um, right. where my purpose and value lies. And to me, I, I kind of look down on that and I need to tamp down that judgmental part of myself because that's sinful and wrong. Um, but that's sort of how I conceive of the good life for me. But then I see a whole other school of thought of libertarians who look at the proliferation of consumer goods. Um, and, you know, the endless stream of Netflix, Hulu and movies and video games and all of this content available for consumption and um, the replica AI girlfriend chatbots and all of these oh, things gosh. that basically enable them to kind of shut themselves inside their houses and never leave. And it's seen as like, OK, well, yay, capitalism, because it's given us all of this and people have infinite choice and, you know, they ought to avail themselves of that if they so choose. But it's sort of there's a certain type of libertarianism that I think sees all yeah. of that as totally fine and well. Whereas I tend to be a little bit more concerned with where that leads, where that takes the soul. Uh, that's not the type of life that I would want for myself. That's not the type of life I would want for my son. And I hope to raise him to be curious about the world around him and to build a sense of like in-person, IRL, non-tech mediated yes. community. And to sort of try to stem the tide of this you know, flourishing of consumer you know, options and products, but I just sort of see it as there's a hollowness and emptiness to that realm that I feel very viscerally. How do you look at these differences within libertarians and what, what's the pitch that you would make to the, like the shut in video gamer libertarian that I'm describing as to why they ought to do something differently and how that's still aligned with their libertarianism? You were made for more. You were made for more than this life it's always there's this paradox right you know we don't want to live at the bare subsistence level of life where we're growing a crop and barely have enough to feed our family we want to have excess so we're not always living on the edge of existence but then there's always a problem that once we have excess that when you live on the edge of existence you want to work hard to survive you want to put effort out there but that's not that's not it ultimately becomes an undignified way to live if you're always worried about, you know, starving to death. But the same. So you want you want excess and comfort. So you don't have to always live in that way. But then the paradox is when you have too much excess and comfort, you become almost inhuman. Right. And I think yeah. people who defend even socialism today and the libertarians you're describing, they would almost have a kind of an overlap saying, look at all this, this stuff that we have. You can go to Netflix. You can. You can, you know, on your phone, you can contact anyone. I am trying to get rid of this thing. I have actually ordered a home phone and now an office phone will come next week so I can just get rid of this. How to can say you just because you? two phones instead of one? Right. Oh. Well, two, fo- but two, yeah, right. Two phones <laughs> that I only spend 20 minutes on a day is better than one phone you spend seven hours on. So and that, you know, and so that, that is, I think you're right that, okay, we have this excess. What are we going to do with it? That many of the libertarians you're discussing 
they correctly identify the present state of affairs, right? Lack of knowledge, human self-interest, uh, the fallibility of human beings, the cautiousness we ought to have and human beings wielding too much power. But they have incorrectly diagnosed the end goal. Okay, we recognize this. We can see what is better. Well, okay, well, now, now what do I do? Where do I go? And that's where I think for many people, even in the libertarian camp, the the general error, whether you're the, a, a radical socialist or radical libertarian, is once I can get society right, things will be great. Once I either get the right people in power or the wrong people out of power or depower the government or empower the government, then things will be fine. At the end of the day, no, it won't. No, it won't. The greatest saints in history lived in some of the worst, under the worst regimes. Some of the worst people in the world grew up in the nicest suburbias. The only thing that can make your life better is you, and you can't do it on your own because you're a sinner. You need help from somebody else. And you know deep down you were not made to spend your weekend just scrolling on your phone watching who knows what on there. <laughs> Let me say as the non-Catholic libertarian on this stream that I ag actually agree with mo much of what you're, both of you are saying. I think there's clearly more to life than empty consumerism and scrolling on your phone and even your debate on the whatever podcast trent i think you know people can get in the clutches of you know falling down rabbit holes uh in terms of mm -hmm. consuming sex online and so forth and this is all stuff right. that we need to be mindful of and careful about and limiting our you know reliant our our addiction to technology um we've talked about uh jonathan heights smartphone idea a lot on this show yeah. um you know I, I send my kids to a waldorf school which is like an intentionally uh anti-technology type of uh environment this is, uh this is secretly I, a waldorf school podcast zach and i are both on I this finally flow, brought like it back to the, the real theme of this, uh, this podcast uh, yeah and we yeah have but, uh, <laughs> yeah but i guess like where the question always the the question that always comes up when we're talking about you know libertarian politics is mm -hmm. where do your moral prescriptions end and the state yeah. intervention begin and you say in this case uh with sex work that you're fine with banning sex work i think we have a disagreement on that but there has been a definite rise in a strain of catholic inspired politics that is calling for a much more robust state, I guess, regulation of the public square. Um, yeah. Sora Bamari is the exemplar of this. I actually pulled yeah. in preparation for this, a slide from his, uh, one of his articles about this, where he says that the only way is through, that is to fight the culture war with the aim of defeating the enemy and enjoying the spoils in form of a public square reordered to the common good and ultimately the higher good. Um, and then he- the Highest this, good, not the higher. We cannot the, be content the, with the higher good. It's the I, highest. Zach. Thank you for that correction. Sorry. Uh, reordered to the common and good and ultimately the Deus highest vault. good. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and um, he's criticizing uh, what he calls David Frenchism in this article. And he says right. that David French, David French, a classical liberal, believes that institutions of a technocratic market society are neutral zones that should, in theory, accommodate both traditional Christianity and the libertine ways and paganized ideology of the other side. And this is not a tenable situation going forward. Um, right. What is your opinion of this, let's say, post-liberal trend right. in Catholic politics? I have a deep sympathy for it. Uh, because I think there's an idea maybe among, you know, Catholic libertarians, this, this ideal would be that we could evangelize people within a, a state and an economy that is fairly neutral when it comes to the big questions of life related to values, religion, and ethics. And we could create an economy that best serves human needs and human flourishing, and then by other means evangelize and build up culture. But I have a deep sympathy for uh, Amari's perspective in this kind of, um, into, I don't know if you would use the label, but like in this in integralism and this this kind of approach yeah. where the state ought to, uh, the state ought to promote the highest good, not not just civil goods, but also religious goods as well and moral goods. 
Uh, because honestly, the state already kind of does do that. I do believe many things related to LGBT ideology, for example, uh, I think it would be fair to consider it a, a religious perspective, right? If if an atheist um, considers my view that the consecrated bread and wine at mass uh, is no longer bread and wine, it's the body and blood of Christ. Now it's under the accidents of bread and wine. That's why it appears to be bread and wine. But the substance has changed. He would say, it looks like bread and wine to me. And you say it's something else. That's religion. But if some, but if, if a man with full working male genitalia goes into a female locker room and I say, that's a man, they say, oh, no, 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 that's a woman. That is a woman. And you have to believe that, that that's a woman. You, you know, it's, it's on par with me saying, no, no, this is really Jesus. And you have to believe it's Jesus or I'm going to send the Inquisition after you. So I'm really sympathetic to Catholics who would say, look, the state already has an inquisition for their religious dogma of, of secular progressivism, and and they're they're not playing fair. Why should we play fair? And to be honest, I would love I would love to live in a society that does promote the highest good for people. I would like to live there. Where I end up backing off of it from this is, I'm just very skeptical about how to get to the end. I'll ask people, well, how do we get there? How do we get there? And I, I I'm just not I'm never really sold about the the path to get there. I think many Catholic libertarians, maybe they're the people who are more the pessimists than the optimists who will say, well, at least incrementally, I can get some stuff to promote human flourishing. So I'll go with that. If you guys succeed, great. But this stuff's working right now and I can make some improvements. That might be the other end. So I guess like I have sympathy, but also skepticism. Yeah, I see where you're coming from. Although I, I do feel that libertarianism basically resolves a lot of those issues because a lot of these issues over locker rooms and so forth should be mediated by private institutions that can decide for themselves, not right. the state dictated. I understand your point that we've got civil rights law that uh, in reality dictates it another way, but I'm just saying if we had a free society, right. that would be a better way to resolve these issues, in, in my opinion. Um, the You know, the, there was but, a recent... But, Zach, but with, with the amount of sort of like, with the sort of like hegemonic cultural forces in certain spheres. Like, I mean, Zach, you used to live in LA for a long time. I live in New York City. With the degree to which some of these things have gripped our culture, do you actually realistically believe that in LA there would be a flourishing of lots of different, like for example, the day spas um, that are sex segregated in Los Angeles? Do you actually believe that there's a significant enough contingent of people where there would be like three or four day spas that are nude and sex segregated um, in the traditional manner, and then like three or four that are trans accepting that would legitimately this, allow consumers to have their choice of the type of environment that best fits their values and needs. Like, is I, that how I, it would actually play out? I do think so, because even in that example with We Spa in Koreatown, there was oh. a big incident where someone was freaking out because a, you know, trans identified female went or into the women's spa and then it created this huge backlash. backlash. So I mean, clearly, like there is a market for women wanting women's only spaces, even in a place like L.A. Um, there also is probably a huge market in L.A. for like all inclusive, like we're not going to discriminate. So I think both can yeah. exist in pretty much every place. Um, it's, it's not going to be perfect, but people we didn't kinda... see that with covid policy. I mean, obviously, in yeah. many of these places, these were mandated by um, the city or the state. But I just even noticed in the sort of COVID aftermath, after some of those restrictions were lifted in New York, the crazy, the degree to which this um, sort of like way of thinking swept like daycares in New York City and and the the sort of broad consensus that child masking is what we ought to do even long after these specific mandates had expired, at least to me, I think instilled a certain cynicism of like, wow, yeah. I want to be able to have this flourishing where parents with different risk tolerances and different um, comfort levels with this pandemic circulating can make their own choices. But at least when I was like shopping for daycares for my son, I felt very much like, wow, I either have to um, be okay with masking a toddler or I have to get out. But there's no uh, option there's, that I could see. There's at that no time. doubt that there's no doubt in the big city, blue state, big blue state cities that there is a monoculture. Um, and that's one reason why that's why I we moved to Texas. Out of there. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, Zach moved to Florida. We moved, we moved to like Dallas that. in yeah. uh, 20, October of uh 2020 so where were you before that san diego oh interesting but, Under, but there is this had uncle real... gavin running everything so yeah <laughs> exactly there there is this this very recent real world example of what we're talking about though with the louisiana uh 
government saying that the Ten Commandments should go in all the public school classrooms. That's an example of, I would say, quote unquote, taking back the public square in a way that I would think even if you're a Catholic, that might make you uncomfortable just because like, what are the religious undertones in a place like Louisiana? Is that ultimately, if it's taken to the extreme, going to be respecting like the Catholic interpretation of Christianity or is it going to be favoring something else? Like, do we really want to go down that path where we're saying, let's let's uh, retake the public squares and order it to whichever common good the governor of said state? Well, you know what's funny about that is in the U.S., public schools mandatory public schooling was was a means to protestantize children that's why catholic churches created the parochial system so it's interesting yep. that in in 1922 oregon tried to outlaw parochial schools saying no you have to go to the government schools and the, the kkk helped them saying yeah we we don't want all this catholic influence got to make everyone a good protestant american and and then the supreme court struck that down in 1925 and Pope Pius XI, here's what's interesting about that. He included a line from that support case. I think it was Pierce Sisters versus Oregon. Pope Pius XI quoted the U.S. Supreme Court in uh, in his work, Divini Ilius Magistri. He quoted the line from that decision, the child is not the mere creature of the state. So I see what you're saying that, you know, when it comes to, uh, I I'm always concerned that the easy solutions are usually aren't always the best solutions. So just, oh, we're just going to put the Ten Commandments out there. I don't, you know, I'm I, I become skeptical about those being that that's going to be the way to, um, you know, promote. So I'd rather just encourage, you know, every school student to take a critical thinking class, for example, and to read uh, laws, read the law of Hammurabi, read the old, read the the Ten Commandments, read Augustine's Confessions, read, you know, to learn this stuff versus whatever they might be given. But I guess I'm more I'm more for something. I'm, I'm more of a pragmatist and a pessimist in my approach. So like when you brought up uh, prostitution, you called it sex working, sex work earlier. Mm -hmm. Like for me, I, I might say, you know what? I'm even, all, if you want it to be legal, fine. I just might be sneaky and say, I just think prostitutes should have to abide by OSHA standards, by OSHA bodily fluid. You have to wear hard hats. Uh, you have to wear, you have to wear, you, you have to, to have, go all I'm saying is then you have to just <laughs> apply all the principles equally. And yes, your way as a good libertarian, your way out of it is just get rid of OSHA yeah. <laughs> entirely. But uh, I guess what, what many people who are like Catholics and Christians, not that they're diapo opposed, of course, Catholicism is a subset of Christianity, is just, I think that the the Amari approach, the integralist approach, swings very far in one direction because it recognizes a, the, of saying we want Christianity to be preferred in the public square, that they're just recognizing that the public square often does prefer other secular ideologies that are religions, but but in name only, I mean, but, but without the name. There's one last thing I wanted to ask you about, Trent, before we get out of here. Um, sure. There's a there's a clip, um, and to be honest, I had some trepidation about playing this clip because it's of Jordan Peterson, and he's become a very polarizing figure. People just have really strong feelings about him, both positive. I clean my room. He doesn't negative. have to yell at me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think it's because you know his political views, the way he expresses them sometimes, and also the way he conducts himself sometimes, but. I would also, just his battles like, with sort of mental illness and addiction, I think, have right. you know, he's all a little bit the of the drama Kanye -esque around him now. Yeah, unfortunately, all this drama around him has created have. uh the it's it's hard to, you know, put people in a neutral mindset. Um, but I would like to just ask our audience to put some of that aside to consider this clip of talking of him talking with a Catholic publication called uh EWTN News about his yes. relationship with Catholicism because it really stuck with me in a profound way since I saw it a few months ago. It was during Easter, and I can't pass up this opportunity to ask a really intelligent Catholic public intellectual like Trent about it. Um, sure. So here's uh, Jordan Peterson talking about his wife Tammy's conversion to Catholicism and then yeah. whether he will also become Catholic on EWTN News around Easter this year. If you have a son or a daughter and you want the best for them, you you, your love is the 
practice of helping that flourish, right? And so, well, this is why Christ says that unless we become as little children, we'll in no wise enter the kingdom of heaven. And I can see that happening to Tammy. And so it's great. It's great. It's ridiculously good. But when you so, see how ridiculously good it is, what is stopping you from embracing the faith of your wife? You mean all those pesky Catholics? <laughs> I don't know if anything is stopping me. What's holding you back? I, I don't think anything's holding me back. Everybody's got their own destiny and soul. Is it in yours? Um, is it in mine? I would say it's unlikely, but... Why do you say unlikely? I exist on the borders of things. So, why is that? I don't know, but that's how it is. I mean, the, the reason I find that so interesting is Peterson is someone who's engaged in such a deep way with the Bible. Yeah. He has created hours of lectures on it, which to my mind, that's by far his most inter interesting intellectual uh, contribution. Um, he yeah. clearly has a deep love and reverence for Christianity. Uh, and yet there's still this distance. Um, and I think it exemplifies something about the modern mind. It may be the modern mind in the postmodern world uh, where we just can't know too much. Um, you can't accept things at face value. Yeah. It's hard to suspend your disbelief in material reality, especially when you're a clinical psychologist with a deep understanding right. of evolutionary forces. And maybe I'm like just projecting some of my own struggles onto this because I do find it to be really relatable in a lot of ways. Um, yeah. And I know I, I threw a lot out there, so take it in any no, direction you want, Trent. But I'm curious well, what you think about that Jordan Peterson moment. I, I think the thing that really moved me emotionally when I was watching that was his answer. And I could tell it was moving him emotionally. Was like what what makes it unlikely? What why wouldn't you belong to that? Is I exist at the borders. I am not someone that just fits into any particular ideological box. I think maybe, and it just made me want to just shout, there's room for all. Uh, Pope Francis often likes to say todos, for all. There's room for all. There's mercy for all. Uh, the blessings are for all, for todos, for all people. Uh, what I love about Catholicism is its rich diversity. I remember an anecdote someone told me about, uh, you know, they had uh, friends who were uh, growing up in New England, they were these, uh, I forget if they were Episcopalian, but they were some kind of high, high church Protestant. And they made fun of Catholicism and they said, I would never kneel down with the help. Uh, you know, that, that yeah. within the Catholic Church, there's such a diversity of socioeconomic backgrounds and also diversity of, of political thought that I love that within this church, like you, you can, you know, be, be a libertarian like myself or Liz, you can have more of a, a progressive perspective as long as you're not endorsing things like abortion or something like that. Uh, I know Charles Camosi, for example, is a bit more left-leaning. I would consider him more centrist, though, writes for American Magazine. I love a, what, a lot of what he writes. I disagree with some of it, but I really appreciate it. Uh, that There's so much diversity within the church of, of the way that you can apply Catholic principles to contemporary problems in life and seeing so many different people, all walks of life, and as Catholics will we'll, we'll good-natured squabble with each other about these secondary and prudential matters that we can dis reasonably disagree about. I would really want to say to, to Jordan Peterson, look, it's fine if you, the church welcomes a maverick thinker, someone who wants to be outside the box, but it, you don't want to be so committed to having a maverick identity that you have absolutely no guardrails on what you're thinking, uh, that if you're the person who, ha if you don't if you don't stand for anything, you'll you'll fall for everything. You know, if, you, if you're saying, oh, well, I can't even say that that's wrong. I can't even have an absolute view here. That's not a way to live either. So that's I just want to say to someone like Jordan Peterson and others like him that what's great about Catholicism, Pope St. John Paul II said in the Faith and Reason, an encyclical he wrote, Fides et Ratio, he said, faith and reason are like two wings raising the human spirit uh, to contemplation. And that's what I love in the tradition of encouraging 
asking these questions and embracing this rich kind of social, political, intellectual diversity uh, you know, within the faith. We see the same thing in the Catholic faith. You have the Franciscans, the Dominicans, all these religious orders with their charisms. They'll even argue about secondary theological issues. But we have a universal covenant with God, one faith, one baptism, one Eucharist that binds us all together. And that's what I think is very beautiful about it. Before we wrap, we wanted to ask you uh, one final question that we ask all of our guests here on this show, Trent. Hmm. What's one question that you think more people should be asking? I think one question one question people should be asking more is, is this who I am? I think a lot of times in life we will do things, and especially when we let other people down, we have this deep feeling, not even that we've done wrong, but that we, you know, you'll have that excuse like, I'm so sorry, this isn't me. That's not who I am. You know, that this isn't what I normally this is this isn't me. And other times we look at ourselves and say, This is I'm not this is not the person I want to be. This isn't who I am. Who who am I? And who am I supposed to be? And I would just encourage a lot of people think about that, especially young people, and they'll go online and they'll the who who should I be? And they'll look at people, po you know, politicians or demagogues or loudmouth people social media or people like andrew tate or they'll look in all of the wrong places but there is a person who created us who became man who died for us he made each of us that we would not exist if he didn't will that we would exist our existence is not an accident he like he made the world so that thousands of generations of people had to survive to reproduction and to make the right choices. And if any of that in the chain failed, we wouldn't be here today. God made it so that it would all come to be. So you, that tell that person, you would be here. Who, who are you? Who are you supposed to be? Think about that a lot more. Life isn't just one, living one day to the next because it's eventually going to come to an end. You need to have that end, understand that end before you get there. Trent Horn, thank you for talking to Reason. Thank you for having me. Thanks for listening to Just Asking Questions. These conversations appear on Reason's YouTube channel and the Just Asking Questions podcast feed every Thursday. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and please rate and review the show.